as it's now 9.30, our scheduled time, I'm just going to begin with acknowledge our psalm for this morning, Psalm 83, pursue them with your tempest. Something you could only say to God, because God can control the storm. And I um, dedicate this morning's study to Hal Levitt, and it's a delight to do so, and that Hal, too, like many of you, is a regular, and I'm glad to see Hal, um, your, some clapping on your behalf with the Levitt name, and I'm drawn to honoring Hal in terms of talking to Hal with both his literature um, background. Hal was a professor, the chair of the Department of English and Foreign Language at Cal Poly Pomona, and he shared that it was the study of Hannah Arendt and teaching class on Holocaust literature that brought him back to Jewish learning. And so as a literature person, it was through Holocaust literature. And this morning's psalm is a psalm about enemies who would seek to annihilate. Verse 5, this is the enemy speaking. Come and let us destroy from a nation, and there will not be remembering a name of Israel evermore. So in verse 5, this enemy seeks to annihilate Israel, again, that Holocaust dimension, another dimension that words initiate action, that's embedded here as well, another key theme in the teaching of Elie Wiesel and others. And it's the last of the Asaf series, those 11 psalms, 12 psalms, 11 in a row, that are written by Asaf, who, this is in part why yesterday I had Julia in mind, in that Asaf in particular has this literary poetic quality of taking the past and cleverly echoing it in how the Psalms are written. In this case, now I'll start with the Psalm, there is a question. There is a question as to the dating of this psalm, and we don't know. And as I mentioned yesterday, there's a thousand-year period, roughly, that it could be written in. From the early Judges, meaning pre-David in the Bible, the book of Judges, all the way to the time of the Greeks have its proponents. Remarkably, there seems to be a diversity of opinions that it comes very early. So Adin Steinsaltz, a contemporary Orthodox commentator, says this psalm is before King David because it mentions the battles against Philistia, like the Philistines. King David was victorious over the Philistines. So Steinsaltz says it, but also Robert Alter whose secular uh, uh, literature professor places this as probably, not definitively, early time of the judges. And yet, the classic commentators, like Art Scroll, picking up on Rabbi David Kimchi, place it after King David, specifically in the time of Jehoshaphat, who was the fourth of the Judah kings. So that's after King David. Jehoshaphat, he reigned for 25 years, from 870 before the common era to 849. Psalm 82, you recall from yesterday, dealt with the need for righteous judges. And there's two chapters in a row in the second book of Chronicles, chapters 19 and 20. In chapter 19, Jehoshaphat, who is seen as a righteous man, a righteous king, hence 25 years of reign, will appoint judges at the beginning of his reign. 
That's partly what sets him up as a model. And then the following chapter, in chapter 20, he goes to battle against his enemies. But God says, I got this. I'll take care of this. As Jehoshaphat leads in prayer for a victorious battle. There is one other key text of the Bible that gets reflected in this psalm. So that is Jehoshaphat against his Midian neighbors, 2 Chronicles, again, 19 and 20. But the, the, the text will also make reference to the book of Judges in that the psalm is divided into two, verses 1 to 9, and then that's Selah, which is about the danger of the enemies. And then verses 10 to 19 is the call for God's action. And there, in that second half, there will be descriptions of battles against Israel's neighbors that Israel was victorious. So in the book of Judges, we have this story of the battles against Sisera and King Yabin, that's Judges 4, King of Chatzor, and then later, just a little bit later, Judges 7 and 8, you have the story of the battles of Gideon against his neighbors, mentioned in verse 12, King Ziba and Zalmuna, and their, his, their generals, Oreb and Zev, the raven and the wolf. So I'll pull this together and then we'll read. In dating, there is no certainty. What is clear is that there are references to other moments in the Bible, in this the final Asaf Psalm. But noteworthy, there are exactly 10 foreign nations mentioned. 10 could be symbolic. And there are victories of an early time, which is to say, these 10 neighbors represent all the directions around Israel in terms of where they're located. Israel is surrounded and has proven itself victorious in the past, which is to say, this could be a historical motif used at a later point as the call for victory. And yet, there's a trajectory that transcends place and time as well to Psalm 83. And the trajectory is two pieces, crying and celebrating, calling on God, feeling redeemed. The trajectory leads to the enemies falling and being ashamed and, most importantly, then acknowledging God that the God of Israel also is a universal God. And that's the trajectory from enemies fighting against the people of Israel to universal acceptance of a God who is the God of goodness. And you'll only see God's yud heh vav -Hey name at the very end of the psalm, then twice, as reaching the place of covenant and then universal acclaim. Here we go. And again, pursue them with your tempest is one of the phrases in the psalm that I chose because it distinctly describes God. God as, as we learn and as it echoes from the song of this sea, Ish Milchama, the person of war, Exodus 15, 3. A song. A psalm of Asaf. God, do not keep silence for yourself. Do not be deaf and do not be still, El. For behold, your enemies are in an uproar. Those that hate you have lifted their head. Against your people they plot secretly and counsel together against your hidden ones. They have said, 
Come and let us destroy from a nation, and there will not be remembering a name of Israel evermore. For they have counseled together with a heart united against you, a covenant they make, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, also Assyria is joined with them. They have been an arm to the children of Lot, Selah. Do to them as with Midian, as to Sisera, as to Yabin, at Brook of Kishon. They were destroyed at Endor. They became as dung for the dirt. Set their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, and like Zeba and Zalmuna, all their princes, who said, let us take possession for ourselves of the pleasantness of God. My God, make them like a wheel, a straw before the wind, as a fire burns a forest and as a flame sets the mountains alone. <coughs> so pursue them with your tempest. And with your storm, terrify them. Fill their faces with embarrassment so that they may seek your name, Adonai. May they be ashamed and terrified forever. May they be disgraced and perish. And may they know for you, your name is Adonai. You alone are most high over all the earth. So now to go to the beginning of the psalm and... Um, analyze some of the some of the thoughts Elohim al dami lach beginning with the name of God that's the universal name or if you will the job description and listen to the use here of the letter Aleph in verse 2 I'm going to read verse 2, and here, we've seen this before, an opening that begins with the first letter of the Aleph Bet emphasized, Elohim, Al Damilach, Al Techarash, the Al Tishkot El. Three times Al, and opening and closing with El, in only a matter of of eight of nine words and again that seems to sometimes be a poetic device that we've seen in Psalms but here the three uses of all don't be still don't be deaf don't be quiet are clearly for emphasis but here we get ale and to link this to Psalm 82 with an insight that I gained clarity from a Huva Ho after class. Yesterday we had this expression in the very beginning of the psalm, um, Elohim Nitzav Ba'adat El. God stands in the congregation of El, same word used here, which is also the Canaanite name for El, which can in some cases point to an earlier composition. Here's what I want to say for clarity over yesterday in terms of who the congregation of El is, and that there's three possibilities to be clear. It could be other gods. It can be God's retinue, meaning God's angels, or it could be the people who are the judges among the people. And I want to make a distinction regarding yesterday between the henotheism, which is many gods but one supreme god that gets put to the side, versus what will endure in the Jewish tradition. So when Rashi described Adad El, he saw that as gods, angelic beings. Angels will continue in rabbinic thought. But as we saw yesterday, the main focus is on human judges, who are also called Elohim, those of power. Well, back to Psalm 82, here we get El, again, which can point to an earlier composition. Poetically, this rep repetition of the Aleph 
three times the repetition of al, do not. And here, the again, the translations will be all over the place in terms of using other language. I use deaf in terms of the harash, which is the contrast to verse 3. God is acting or failing to act as if deaf. But meanwhile, verse 3, the enemies, they're noisy. For behold, your enemies are in an uproar. Yehemun. Radak will translate this as make noise from Hema. Though Ibn Ezra, about the same time, 11th, 12th century, will see it as Yehemun. There are in multitudes. Your enemies are in a multitude. <laughs> but the uproar contrasts more clearly with verse 2. Those that hate you have lifted their head. Now there is the image of arrogance. They've lifted their head as if they're above others, which will be part of where this will lead because coming full circle, they are going to be disgraced, embarrassed. Verse 17, cologne meaning red. Kalui means to be bo boiled, so meaning red-faced. And that'll be somewhat the envelope here, that those who lift up their heads with pride, they will ultimately have shame face. Against your people they plot secretly. And there will be a distinction between Amcha, your people, and Goy in verse 5. They're complementary, but... Some commentators, like Malbim, will say Amcha is the heartfelt connection. It's the people of identity. You're identified as being part of a people. And Goy, in verse 5, a nation, is a political entity. And so, against your people. Now, here's something else to note, is the concept of being against verse 4 and verse 6. In Hebrew, it's the word al. But verse 4, these enemies, they're plotting in secret, they're counseling, they're using words against your hidden ones. Literally at the Seder, we talk about safun, which is the afikomen, the thing that's hidden away. That's the, a rarely used word, but it means hidden one, often translated as your treasured one, that the things that are treasured are wrapped, you know, your jewelry is wrapped and hidden away. So your hidden ones, they're against them. But now, verse 6, against you, for they have counseled together the same word of counsel getting repeated in 4 and 6, as is the word against in 4 and 6. But now it's against you. Because part of the message of this psalm and its trajectory is that those who seek to destroy Israel are really also trying to obliterate you, God. Hence, verse 5, they have said, come and let us destroy from a nation, as a nation, and there will not be remembering a name of Israel evermore, meaning the name of Israel, which includes God's name, Yisrael, the one who wrestled with God. They want to obliterate our name. They want to obliterate your name. What is against us is against you. And now back to counseling. For they have counseled together with a heart united. And the commentators will emphasize that normally their hearts are divided, but to take on or to eradicate the Jews, that motivates them to come together. And also, back to this theme of the power of words, counseled. When they speak, that can lead to action. And to emphasize, second part of verse 6, it's against you. And here's the double entendre, breach 
covenant is what God has with Israel, but here they're making a covenant with each other against you. Kind of an emotional valence agreement of covenant, here a covenant of hatred, and now again symbolically perhaps, ten enemies who surround in every direction, Edom to the southeast, the Ishmaelites understood as the south, the Moabites to the east, the Hagrites, descendants of Hagar, northeast, Gebal, though it's a bit unclear who Gebal is, identified as northwest, Ammon and Amalek, south, Philistia, along the coast to the west and Tyre to the north and Assyria, which would be north. But here's a problem in dating. Assyria doesn't really go to war against Israel till much later, you know, until the 8th and 7th centuries, 6th century before the Common Era, which would put this long after Gideon, long after David. Some say that Philist, or it could make this very early, as I mentioned. That's why, well, no, Philistia is why it's early, but Assyria would be late. Some say that it could be Assyria, but not the mighty empire of Assyria. This is an earlier time where Assyria is making agreements because it's not so mighty and creating coalitions. My sense is this is all symbolic written at a later point. That's my sense because of the round number 10 and because of this anomaly of Assyria. Placing this far, far in the future regarding who these nations are, Midrash Tehillim, which is um, not so clear when it's written, 6th, 7th, 8th century, they see this as a David Psalm written with prophecy about the Romans. Romans are often called Edom, verse 7, and that Edom would form an alliance, namely Rome, with the nation surrounding Israel to destroy the temple, which is again to say for readers reading in their own times, they can place this in many different times. And now the call to action, beginning verse 10. Asay lahem kemidyan, do to them as with Midian. And that points to the book of Judges, and particularly to the battles of first Sisera with King Yabin. That's the battle of the prophetess Devorah, her general Barak, and their victories. And then they were destroyed at Endor. No mentioned in the Bible of a battle at Endor, though the place is mentioned a couple of times. They became as dung for dirt. That, of course, is the greatest um, defeat where you're, the enemy is not buried. They're trampled upon and left as dung in the field of battle. And now the shift of talking about the battles of Gideon, also in the time of the judges, Oreb and Zev, this is yeah, the battles against Midian, Amalek, and the Kedamites, and using these past echoes of victory, the last one being Judges 7 and Judges 8. Then, verse 13, who said, let us, this is the enemies speaking now, let us take possession for ourselves of the pleasantness of God. Naot is literally pleasantness, and my leaning is to do things literally and leave it vague, but most commentators fill it in to be either pleasant houses, pleasant pastures, um, all referring to the land of Israel. 14, my God, make them like a wheel, 
as straw before the wind. Here too, kagagal is literal, that's a wheel. Some translate it like art scroll as a as whirling thistles, you know, like a sagebrush, whirling thistles. Um, another translation, whirling wheel. The notion is they should constantly be having to move, ungrounded, untethered, as straw before the wind, getting blown, as a fire burns a forest, as a flame sets the mountains ablaze, so pursue them with a tempest, sa'arecha. And here's an interesting comment on this word tempest. Radak, Rabbi David Kimchi, will say that is self-madness. May the enemy, may the enemy be pursued by their own craziness. Samson Raphael Hirsch, now going forward many hundreds of years to 19th century Germany, will say that sa'arecha sounds like sachar, which also has this element of being whipped about. He'll translate it as whipped around madly. So that here, what they're being asked for in verse 16 is may the enemy begin to do battle among themselves with a quality of the madness that led them to believe that they could defeat you, God, that led them to, you know, to see us as their enemy. And therefore, with your storm, terrify them. Sufatecha also has sof, that which has no end. It'll feel endless for them, the terror, the lack of grounding. Fill their faces with embarrassment. As I mentioned, kalon is a rare word. It's understood by some as being from kalui, which means burnt, red-faced, so they may seek your name. That when they are at this point of their own shame, they will then have the awareness that they are defeated, and they will then seek your name, name used earlier as the name of your people, now the name of God. And here appears for the first time the word Adonai. The trajectory has led us to the name of God that's identified with Brit, with covenant, with intimacy, the God of Israel. Verse 18, may they be ashamed and terrified forever. May it be unending. May they be disgraced. And then, yo vedu, and perish. I'll come back to the word and perish, verse 19, the last verse. And may they know for you, your name is Adonai, you alone are most high over all the earth. The one thing I've done that I haven't seen in other translations is I've taken the second word in verse 19, key, and translated as it usually is translated as for. Usually in other translations, and may they know that you I, um, is commonly. I did for you because what we've seen is that the trajectory of Psalms is I will sing your praises as if what God seeks is to be recognized. That's the core of the relationship, that God is in relationship, recognized. So there will be knowing their knowledge, these enemies' knowledge, is for you. Just like it was against you, their hatred, their faith is for you, meaning honoring you. And what is it that honors God? The recognition that God is Adonai, which is the name of God that implies kindness and intimacy and covenant. And last, that you alone are most high over the earth. And that's also yesterday's emphasis and the link between Psalm 82, this emphasis on levadecha, you alone, no other gods. And even if there are angels, they only do your bidding. For you alone are the God most high and universal.
over all the earth. And with that as 10 o'clock straight up, <laughs> I now invite some of your reactions to Psalm 83, the last of the Asaf Psalms. Tomorrow, by the way, Psalm 84 will be the beginning, will be another Psalm of Korach. Korach, who gets swallowed by the earth in the book of Numbers. His sons are recorded in the book of Chronicles as key singers in the temple. And there will be only the most recorded psalms are David, I think 74. There are 12 Asaf psalms, and there are 11 of Korach throughout Psalms. So he's number three of the 10 authors who get a name on Psalms. Some Psalms have no name as well. All right, with that, Psalm 83. Any thoughts um, and comments to Psalm 83? Vivian, is that you? I would love to hear your com It's not? I, you're muted. I'm muted because I wasn't preparing to speak, just oh. adjusting the screen. But I will say that my, uh, my puzzlement in reading, yeah, I always look for a puzzlement, you know, I, it's a great song. May I skip over that part, okay? You can take that for me. But I am puzzled between the uh, verses, and I think they were, that's why I was trying to, to move my screen, 17 and 18, because... Uh, and the difficulty in translation is so very often uh, transition. The, uh, the little words that either are or aren't spoken and but so and like that. So I was surprised. I don't know this psalm. I had ne never before today heard or read it. It would seem to me that when we were saying, when one was saying, um, may they be what they are, embarrassed or acknowledge your name. I, I cannot remember the exact words. Yeah. Uh, then it says, I, I, I'm there for the terror. I understand the terror. Uh, French Revolution thought terror could be a good thing too, but that they would be perish, be extinguished once they had acknowledged your name. That to me is a puzzlement that I ask for help. I'm so glad you did, Vivian. Again, a very sensitive ear in hearing it. Let me read 17 and 18 and then focus on the word that Vivian is aware of, and that's that the enemies will perish. So here's 17 and 18. Fill their faces with embarrassment so that they may seek your name, Adonai. May they be ashamed and terrified forever. May they be disgraced and perish. And what Vivian points out is, and then verse 19 begins, and may they know for you, your name is Adonai. You alone are most high over all the earth. So some commentators will say, well, if they've perished, then verse 19 doesn't flow because uh, they don't have, they're dead. They're not going to know. So that's a tension. And some say that they'll perish later after they've done the repentance. Others say that some translate it instead of perish, yo, vedu, which is literal, they'll just say are doomed, which means they'll know that they're doomed rather than having literally died. They'll come to the recognition that it's over. Their war is pointless rather than them literally dying. So again, that's the ambiguity and here, the, sol the psalmist ends with this word, meaning it is as if, is if they recognized 
that they're, that they're doomed. And that may have been the reason people will use that translation to avoid what is literal, that they've perished. And again, I think it's psychological that he wants the stronger, the strongest word, which is perish, but it doesn't mean literally perish. It means they recognized it's as if what they stood for is no longer. There is no battle to be had. But I'm so glad you pointed that out because that's a real tension in terms of the literal versus the metaphorical understanding of that word, Vedu. And again, that's the nature of poetry. This poem, as is the case yesterday, and for many of the Asaf, uses words that are extreme to convey emotion and to convey the sense of um, the challenge that's before God. I will add as an aside, there is on uh, the Orange County Community Scholar Program, OCCSP.net, currently is Ariel Berger. He was the teaching assistant to Ellie Wiesel, doing a whole month of classes on storytelling in the Jewish tradition. And in the opening on Sunday evening, Ariel Berger said, what defines a Jewish story? It's a story that has two parts, tears and rejoicing, pain and hope. And that's clearly um, true for Psalm 83. In that sense, it's written with hyperbole in part. You know, God, you're deaf. Stop being deaf. And yet, God, you're all-knowing. And you can maneuver nature to defeat the enemy, as was described in that battle of Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles 20. So again, that's a key motif. By the way, what Gideon and Jehoshaphat share in common, those are the two echoes, their battles here, is when Gideon is victorious in battle, they'll say to him, be you know, king over us, and he says, only God. He's responsible for the victories. Only God is to be worshipped. Gideon, that warrior, is the model of piety, as is Jehoshaphat, who will reign and be identified as the true heir to David in 2 Chronicles also, saying of Jehoshaphat um, 17.3 that he was righteous. So again, setting this up not to be literally written in the midst or before a particular battle, but as the motif of a history as a people of our righteous warriors who God enabled and fought to bring defeat against foe. Um, one last comment. That was a long response to Vivian, but important. Um, Anybody? I saw Mary moving. Go ahead, Mary. Un unmute. Um, I have a question more. You spoke about the controversy of when this was written. Um, yes. And it's assigned, it's, it's assigned to Asaf. But if it's, if it's just one person, um, then it has to be written during all these during his lifetime. But yet there's a controversy of of such a big span of time. So how could it be assigned to a psalm? <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, so let me clarify that, Mary. The psalm does not say when it was written, what battle per se prompted it, as some psalms do. Even the ones that do, though, um, biblical scholars will ask and say, is that just because it's a classic motif that's given weight to a later moment? Um, so it's unclear. And so some will say this is written before King David because of the mention of the Philistines who King David will defeat. Some say, no, this is after King David, although making reference to earlier times during the time of Jehoshaphat, you know, 300 years later, because he's a righteous king. And it gives context to Psalm 82 and 83 together in terms of 
one chapter dealing with justice, the next with wars fought on behalf of God. Others will always put these battles as the destruction of the first temple, but some will put it even further to the time of the Greeks or even a prophecy relating to Edom as a substitute word for Rome. So that's where you get the thousand years. But here's something to pull this together. I came across a quote the other day, may have even been on television, of Helen Keller. Here's the quote from Helen Keller, and I use it to pull together the Psalms of Asaph. Helen Keller said, that great teacher who was an exemplar of living with blindness, blindness cuts us off from things. Deafness cuts us off from people. Yesterday, we constantly had the word Shema, listen. We've had that. We had it here. God, do not be deaf. Al Techarash. For the image of these Psalms is relationship with God. For there to be relationship, words matter. Words matter. Words can be used by an enemy to create a breach, a covenant of war against good. Words can be used for good to reach out to God, as Jehoshaphat did before his battle, calling on God in prayer, or as the psalmist does, calling on God that leads to reclaiming relationship of yud heh vav -Hey, that leads to this messianic image of those who wanted to wipe out your name, God, by wiping out our name of Israel, will be defeated, will go mad, fall into their own traps, and ultimately come to recognize that there is only one God who is the God of justice, who is also a God of intimate relationship with us, the people of Israel. And so that's what makes, again, psalms, psalms. And with that, through studying psalms, we have the opportunity to honor loved ones. I invite those needing to say Kaddish to do so at this moment. And after, Vivian, if you can just stay on for a moment. And so Kaddish Yatom. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shemei rabah. Be alma divra kirute, the amlich malchute, Bechaye hon of Yome hon, Ufhaye the hall bait Yisrael, Ba agala of Yisman Kari vimruamein. Yehe shme rabba mevarach, Leolamul meal maya, Yit barach, the yishtabach, Vit baar, vit romam, vit nase, Vit adar, vit ale, vit alal. Shemei de Kudsha Berichu, Leela, Minko Birchata Vishirata, Tushbechata Venechemata, Damiran Bielma Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shlama, Rabba, Min Shemaya, Vechaim Alenu, Vilkol Yisrael, Vimru, Amen. O say, Shalom Bimromav, Huya Ase Shalom, Alenu, Vilkol Yisrael, Vakol Yoshve Tevel. The Imru. Amen. Amen. I want to say how good it is, Robert Ellenson, to see you back after a little bit of a hiatus with your wife, to see uh, Rabbi Podwell, to see each of you. Thanks to each of you for sharing. And I want to particularly honor again today a regular Hal Levitt, another no. literature professor, for enabling us to see both the literary dimensions of this psalm but more its spiritual religious trajectory that makes it a t particular kind of literature. So Hal, again, much to honor you and to each of you, thank you. Have a good day.